um, uh, one uh, invited talk uh, and then followed by um, several uh, contributed talks, a total of uh, seven talks. And uh, we have uh, speakers uh, from here um, in the US, um, as well as uh, several speakers uh, from Nepal. Um, and uh, the, the rule is the following. Um, for invited talk, um, uh, it is 25 uh, plus five. And uh, for um, contributed uh, talk, um, it is uh, 10 plus 2. So I will uh, try to set up an LRAM. Um, and if it goes off, that means uh, your time uh, um, is over. And uh, there would be some uh, additional time that is um, left for questions. OK. Um, so I will also try to give you some warnings, like uh, especially for the invited talk, few minutes before um, your time is over. But when you hear the bell, um, you know that it means your twenty minutes is over. Uh, for contributed talks, your um, ten minutes is over. Um, so with that uh, rules, uh, let me uh, introduce um, our uh, first uh, speaker. Uh, this is um, uh, Dr. Tika Kafle. Uh, he um, is uh, from uh, University of uh, Colorado, um, Boulder, um, and uh, uh, he is um, a postdoctoral fellow um, in Gila, um, a place uh, that is well known for AMO physics. Um, and um, he uh, received his PhD uh, recently uh, from University of uh, Kansas. Uh, and um, today we are excited to hear from him um, on his uh, PhD work, mostly, I believe, on uh, charge transfer, uh, exciton, and dis uh, dissociation dynamics um, at uh, organic TM disease. And um, I I'd like to thank you very much for um, accepting our invitation, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Take it away. Thank you, some sir, for the introduction. Uh, so basically, uh, I'll be talking about uh, the charge transfer exciton and dissociation dynamics at organic TMDC heterostructures. So this is the work which I did while I was a PhD student uh, until last year at KU. So uh, here is a brief outline of my talk. So a short introduction and motivations that why we study organic and TMD heterostructures the experimental methods that we apply to study the charge transfer dynamics and sure. the results which we have uh, for the charge transfer dynamics and that we see it from the perspective of interfacial energy landscape and the conclusions drawn therefrom. So why organic uh, uh, and to the materials? So because these organic semiconductors, uh, they are low weight and flexible. Um, and they have a large absorption coefficient and it is very easy to integrate these organic materials with other devices and they have tunable up to electronic properties. So what does that mean is that uh, uh, these organic photovoltaics, like they are very flexible, like it can be folded unlike the conventional silicon based solar cells, which are brittle in nature. And even a small space is enough uh, for it to acquire uh, the, to harvest the solar energy. So this is a see through window. So it can be easily integrated on uh, uh, house windows and we can see the outside surroundings. And these organic materials can also be used uh, to display the screens of uh, TV screens, uh, cell phones, and so on. On the other hand, uh, the transition metal dichalcosanides, they are the semiconductors of the type MX2. So where M is the transition metals over here and X is the calcosan uh, atoms over here. So they have good electron mobility, they have strong spin orbit coupling, and they have good tunable electrical properties. Uh, and one important thing about these 2D materials is that uh, they are bond, they are layered materials and they are bonded by van der Waal interaction. So they can be exfoliated down to a single layer and which can be applied for different uh, devices. So, but they have some limitations. So these organic semiconductors, they have low carrier mobility. And uh, in the case of TMDs, so it is very uh, difficult to uh, synthesize uh, large scale TMD materials and, and which is defect free. 
So, but one way to bypass that limitation is to form a mixed dimensional heterostructures. So here is one example in which uh, this organic, uh, this single layer MOS2 is treated with organic molecule and that removes the defect of MOS2 and enhances the mobility of MOS2. So here it's an, another example. So the organic, the organic material is combined with uh, MOS2 to form a vertical, uh, a very thin vertical PN junction and that really narrows down the uh, electronic, uh, electronic devices. And so these organic uh, materials can also be combined with 2D materials to form the organic photovoltaics. So they have uh, a wide range of applications, even in uh, photo detectors, memory devices, and so on. <clears throat> So, uh, but personally, the thing that motivates me is the statement from George uh, Mallory. Um, so once a news reporter asked uh, him that, why do you want to climb Mount Everest? And he said, because it is there. So organic and 2D materials, they have already proven its application. So once now, when we combine with this organic uh, and the 2D materials, so there is a lot of uh, interesting properties to be explored. In fact, uh, the importance of the 2D materials was already realized by a Finn man in early 50s. So at that time, he was motivating his students to explore the thin layers of 2D materials. But it almost took uh, 50 years uh, to get a single layer uh, graphene, uh, a single layer 2D material, which is graphene that was exfoliated from graphite. And, and this really opened, a, this was a major breakthrough and it opened a new era for atomically thin materials for solid state electronics. And because of that, they won the Nobel Prize, these two guys, uh, the Jim and Novoselov. So they won the Nobel Prize in 2010. So, uh, uh, but this graphene, it had limitations because it had a zero band gap. So people started looking for another 2D materials in which there was a band gap. So the same group came up with another 2D materials. There's MOS2 and this is NBS2, uh, a kind of, uh, of 2D material. So, uh, and then this is graphene, sorry. Um, so they came with these, and uh, and so uh, so and and its applications was uh, 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 realized in many devices. So uh, in 2010, uh, so uh, uh, this uh, Feng Wang group they studied uh, uh, different uh, layers of MOS2, and they found that a single layer MOS2 had a very high uh, PL yield, the photoluminescence yield, and they attributed that high PL yield to direct optical band gap of uh, the MOS2. So this again opened a, a broader area for its applications, and. Uh, coming back in, uh, in 2013, so to my knowledge, so this is the first heterostructure other than graphene that com that consists of a single layer material uh, to form a PN junction. So they combined the carbon nanotube with the single layer MOS2 and the PN junction was formed and the electrical characteristics of this material could be controlled by, con by applying the uh, uh, bias voltage. So uh, in 2014, so they form uh, these uh, Tony Hinz group, so they form the atomically thin PN junctions, which consist of 2D materials, single layer. Uh, one was MOS2 and the other is WSC2. And I believe, so this is uh, one of uh, the um, uh, smallest uh, material uh, uh, to its quantum limit. Um, until now, but uh, but getting this kind of heterostructures is challenging because it is very small and it is very difficult to get defect free. So people were starting to uh, think of mixed uh, hybrid heterostructures, and then in 2014, um, uh, so people came with different uh, try to mix materials with different dimensions. So here uh, there is a zero D material that is PVC quantum dots, and then MOS2, and then from by mixing. These hybrid heterostructures, so uh, they got a very high performance uh, photo detectors. So till that date, so I just went to this website and then checked. So uh, with the keyword organic TMDC heterostructures, so this website is handy to get the related papers. So and I found that uh, from to, to, uh, 2012, so there is a rise in the study of organic TMDC heterostructures. While this number may be very small enough. But if I just go to this organic and if I choose the word 2D heterostructures, this number goes to tens of thousands. So this already shows that why uh, mixed hybrid heterostructures is very important and why it is gaining interest. <clears throat> 
So, but how does it work? So uh, basically the organic TMDC heterostructures, so uh, we can think them as, as of donor and acceptor. So upon a photon absorption, so we can selectively excite one material. Say if we uh, excite donor material, then the excitone is formed. So the reason why excitone is formed is because uh, these materials, both of these materials, they have low dielectric constant. And because of the low dielectric constant, they have a higher binding, Coulomb binding energy. And this binding energy is greater than the thermal energy at room temperature at room temperature, so it cannot overcome uh, uh, this binding energy. So basically the excitone is formed and it gets diffused to the interface and somehow it finds some mechanism to uh, separate uh, uh, this uh, electron and hole and the free charge carriers are generated. So the thing, what is going here is I've described over here. So the excitone is formed and then uh, the electron gets transferred to uh, the acceptor, but still they are columbically bound. And this state of excitone is known as charge transfer excitone or CT excitone. And they find some mechanism uh, uh, such that this electron gets separated uh, from this hole. And this state is known as the charge separated state. So when I'm saying the mechanism, so people have proposed different mechanisms. So uh, while I'll not discuss these mechanisms over here, uh, so, but this is still an area of active research. So my focus will be on the role of the interfacial energetics that how uh, that is used, that uh, what role does it play uh, to uh, separate the electron and hole from the excitone. So this is the cartoon of uh, the uh, uh, material that I use, the heterostructure. So uh, GNPC, uh, it's an organic molecule and, and it's free electrons the, are the pi electrons and it moves along the pi chain. So this pi chain, uh, uh, this pi stacking of this uh, molecule can be controlled by its orientation. If these uh, molecules have phase and orientation, the pi stacking direction is perpendicular to the interface. And, and if it has, uh, uh, say if it has like a standing up orientation, then the pi stacking direction is parallel to this uh, interface. Uh, in this case, the electron and hole, they are least overlapped. So uh, there is uh, more chances of uh, getting dissociated. Uh, uh, the electron and hole uh, can uh, uh, get dissociated more easily than here, because here this electron and hole, they are, uh, they are in parallel to each other. So they are very, the electron and hole are very close to each other. So there is less chances of exciton separation. So for our study, so I took uh, MOS2. So MOS2, it consists of uh, molybdenum atoms at the central, and it has two sulfur atoms. The molybdenum atoms is sandwiched between the two sulfur atoms. So on both monolayer MOS2 and bulk MOS2, this GNPC, it maintains phase one orientation. So, and I'll be discussing about uh, the dynamics on these two different heterostructures. So for the experimental technique, so we use thermal evaporation to grow the organic molecules. So this is basically the lab where I did most of my work. So we grow the organic molecules over here. And then once when we grow the organic molecules, we transfer to the main chamber. And from the main chamber, uh, uh, so uh, we, uh, we have the laser setup. So that is called time resolved two photon photo emission techniques. So basically it consists of two laser pulses, the pump and the probe. And because of this delay stage, we can control the time delay between these two laser pulses and, and, uh, and the electron can be uh, ejected from the sample. And basically the analyzer, it, uh, it collects the information about the energy and time dynamics of the excited states of the electron. So we have another technique called ultraviolet photo emission technique. So, so this, in, it investigates the energy of the occupied electronic states. So both of these techniques are, uh, UPS and the 2PP, so they are surface sensitive. It means that we are collecting the electrons only from the surface. So, so the surface has to be really very clean. So that is why we perform all the experiment in ultra high vacuum chamber. <clears throat> so what does that mean? Uh, so uh, here, uh, so we have the pump pulse, it, uh, uh, it excites the material and it forms excitone and the second pulse comes after a certain time and it ejects this electron and we get a very nice 2D data. And from there, we can get the dynamics of a certain state. And then we also can get the energy spectrum uh, of that state. Um, so 
in the ups we just use a single pulse and from the single pulse it gives uh, us the information about the occupied electronic states if it is inorganic material we can get the balance band maximum if it is organic material so we can get uh, uh, the homer, so the highly occupied molecular orbitals so that corresponds to the valence band maximum in the case of inorganic materials. So for the characterization, so uh, so since our uh, monolayer MOS2 is CVD grown, so people uh, doubt about the uh, quality of this. So we performed some characterization, we did, we performed some RPOS experiment, we found some uh, valence band uh, maximum at the K point and the gamma point, and we did some PL measurements. So all this corresponds to the exfoliated. They they match with the exfoliated monolayer MOS2, so it is very good. So we also uh, uh, did uh, some uh, lead uh, diffraction uh, measurements. So lead is a low uh, uh, low electron energy diffraction. So and from there, so we can get a very nice, good crystalline uh, uh, structure of the bulk MOS2, and from and so which means our surface, the surface quality of the sample is very good. And for this phason orientation, which I discussed earlier, so we can uh, know what orientation of that material is from by measuring the ionization potential. Usually, the ionization potential of the phason orientation is like at least 0.3 EV higher than the standing up uh, orientation of the molecules. So this uh, uh, ionization potential will matches uh, with uh, the phase one stacking of the organic molecules. And also we can measure uh, the, um, the diameter of uh, uh, the ring diameter of these uh, you know, molecules from, uh, from this lead diffraction pattern by using the beam energy. So this also says that this uh, organic molecule has a phase one stacking. So uh, while this, this is the data, so it may look quite complicated, uh, but I'll try to simplify it. So this is the UPS spectrum of GNPC on uh, monolayer MOS2, different thickness of GNPC, which I've labeled here. And this is the different thickness of GNPC grown on bulk MOS2. So the valence band maximum, so the weight corresponds just for the MOS2, and the others are different thickness deposited on MOS2. So the valence band uh, maximum is over here with the, uh, the with the pink uh, lines over here and the black dashed lines which represents the homo positions of the GNPC molecules. So these positions are plotted over here. So when we see here, so for the GNPC grown on bulk MOS2, we see there is a band banding of at least 0.5 EV as the thickness increases from 0.5 nanometer to 10 nanometer. But when we just go with the GNPC grown on monolayer MOS2, so, they, so the uh, band bending is not that sharp. So we see the band bending of about uh, from 1.35 to around 1.6, so about 0.2 EV. So uh, and when we try, so we try to measure this uh, the offset between the homo peaks and the balance band uh, edge of these two mono uh, of these two MOS2. So when we measure this uh, difference between this, uh, the valence band maximum of these two MOS2, so there is a difference of 0.65 EV here. So when we grow the organic molecules on top of it, so we expect the similar offset uh, uh, difference between the different thickness of GMPC grown on these two uh, different MOS2s. But surprisingly, so we don't see that uh, uh, difference in the offset. So for thin films, so we see uh, that they have similar offsets, but as the film uh, grows thicker for bulk MOS2, uh, for the GNPC grown on bulk MOS2. So we see a sudden jump uh, in the offset uh, in the difference of this uh, energy uh, uh, from one nanometer to two nanometer of GNPC. Uh, but uh, we don't see that uh, such, a, uh, such a large difference in the case of GNPC grown on uh, monolayer MOS2. So this, this offset here, it explains why we have a different dynamics uh, for the charge transfer with, that I will show later. So after once when we get the HOMO uh, peaks, and uh, so we have this excited peaks from the measurement from the 2PP, and we have this valent band maximum from uh, over here. So we can draw the band alignment. So it has a type two band alignment, both of these two uh, heterostructures. So the type two band alignment, it supports the charge transfer because the electron it always tries to go to the lower energy. So, so there is so there is the possibility of charge transfer. So, 
So we did, first did a very quick check whether there is a charge transfer or not. So we grow two nanometer GNPC on MOS2 and two nanometer GNPC on silicon dioxide. So we see there is the PL quenching of two nanometer GNPC grown on uh, grown on MOS2. So this shows that the PL quenching shows that there is the charge transfer from GNPC to MOS2. So this is the 2D uh, image of the 2PP spectrum. So uh, the above one is for the GNPC grown on monolayer MOS2, and the down one is for the GNPC grown on bulk MOS2. So upon photon, uh, uh, upon photon uh, excitation, uh, so the singlet uh, states are populated. The singlet states are in GNPC. So we see, uh, so in both of these materials, we see the singlet states are populated, but this singlet state, it dies very quickly. So within 100 femtoseconds for both of these materials. But then we see this lower energy states are populated uh, uh, in both of these heterostructures. So this is at a larger time scale. So we see that uh, this uh, lower energy state, it starts, uh, uh, it starts decaying. So what does this say? The, the, this decay of this singlet state, it says that uh, the, there is the charge transfer from GNPC to monolayer. Uh, since our uh, technique is surface sensitive, the GNPC is at the top. So once when it goes to the monolayer, we cannot detect those electrons. So it decays very quickly. So this corresponds to the charge transfer from GNPC to MOS2. But in the case of these uh, uh, two different heterostructures, uh, this uh, lower energy state, it starts decaying, but it starts growing in the case of bulk system. So if we go to a further time scale, so we see uh, this uh, lower, en lower energy state, it completely decays within 20 picoseconds of time. But in the case of bulk system, we see there is the increase in the intensity. So if so, here it is from 5,000 to like a few, uh, uh, like nearly by an order of magnitude increase in the intensity. So further going uh, uh, to a higher uh, time scale to 300 uh, picoseconds, that was the maximum time scale we could reach. So uh, there is the increase in intensity. Uh, so what does this says to us is that uh, since it is lower in energy and it has a longer lifetime. So we attribute this state to uh, the triplet state uh, in GNPC. So basically the triplet state of GNPC is at 1.1 in uh, EV above the HOMO level. So this is the HOMO that corresponds with respect to GNPC. So, so uh, we attribute this state to the triplet state we did some control measurements that whether that was from the uh, uh, um, MOS2, uh, the signal from MOS2 or just from the GNPC. So when we did uh, uh, measured uh, on MOS2, so we don't have any signals. And when we do that on 10 nanometer GNPC, so we don't see any lower energy states populated. We just see the singlet states and that is a very longer lifetime. So whatever the dynamics, so which, we, which I showed earlier, so that is basically coming from the interface of the two materials. So here, uh, this is the dynamics uh, of the singlet state here. So that is the singlet state in the monolayer system and that is the singlet state in the bulk system. So as I said earlier, so there was a less band bending in the case of GNPC grown on monolayer MOS. So because of that less band bending, so, uh, uh, so there is even energy landscape. So whenever there is even energy landscape, so the uh, electron does not localize. So uh, the, uh, the size of the electron, uh, it, uh, it remains delocalized. So the delocalization size, I mean to say that the size of the exciton. So uh, since it is uh, uh, because of the list band bending, so uh, the uh, exciton gets delocalized and then it quickly gets transferred to the MOS2. So, and, and since the list band bending was observed for 0.5, 1 and 2 nanometers, so basically we see the same type of uh, dynamics over here. So this decay, it again corresponds to the charge transfer from GNPC to monolayer. But as we go from in the bulk system, so I showed earlier that as we move from one nanometer to two, two nanometers, so there was a sharp uh, increase in this uh, band banding. So that is why we see so uh, this uh, difference in uh, the, the dynamics of the singlet state. 
so which is thickness sensitive so because of that uneven energy landscape so the uh, 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 this electron uh, gets localized um, so it does not become delocalized uh, so so that uh, this uh, decay time uh, it uh, it increases as the thickness of the gnpc keeps on increasing so coming back to the lower energy states uh, that I showed earlier. So in the case of monolayer MOS2 system, so we saw that uh, the, this city state, like it dies within 20 picoseconds. So basically uh, it dies within 20 picoseconds, within 20 seconds. But in the case of bulk MOS2 uh, bulk system, the triplet state dynamics, like it keeps on increasing. So what does that say is that, so in the bulk system, so once the electron goes to uh, this from GNPC to MOS2 system, so there is uh, the spin flipping, uh, the spin flipping takes place. And once when there is spin flipping, so there is the possibility of the back electron transfer from MOS2 to GNPC. And, and it forms a triplet exciton in GNPC. But in the case of monolayer MOS2 system, so it decays. So this, it either says that uh, there should be the recombination of uh, this electron and hole so that we don't have any signal, or either this uh, electron uh, and hole gets separated and now the electron is in a monolayer system and our system cannot detect that. So to observe that, so uh, we did a transient observation spectroscopy in collaboration with uh, Dr. Hughes Agro. So, so this is the signal for just GNPC. And this is the GNPC grown on a monolayer MOS2 system. So uh, for, uh, for this uh, GNPC grown on monolayer MOS2 system, we see this state like uh, this uh, signal, it decays uh, till 20 picoseconds, so which is similar to this dynamics over here, the spectrum over here. So, and then it's, it slowly increases. So that means now the electron is in uh, the monolayer MOS2. So, so we confirm that uh, the electron and hole gets dissociated in the case of GNPC grown on monolayer MOS2 system. <clears throat> so we also did uh, a quick measurement of GNPC grown on bulk WSE2 system. So uh, basically uh, this system, it has a type two uh, sorry, type one band alignment. So, uh, so once when we excite this system, so there is the electron transfer from GNPC to uh, WSE2, but at the same time, the uh, transfer of hole also takes place. So, once. Tika, sir, you have uh, four minutes uh, left, including okay. questions. So I'm about to finish. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so uh, since uh, both electron and hole transfer takes place, so, uh, so there is a recombination, and then we just see the decay signal over here. So, to summarize between these two heterostructures, so there is the band banding of 0.2 EV in GNPC grown on monolayer MOS2 system, but there is 0.5 EV in GNPC grown on bulk MOS2 system. So, uh, so the singlet excitons are formed, uh, and the ultrafast charge transfer takes place within 100 femtoseconds. And then the CT rate, the charge transfer rate is independent of thickness in the case of uh, monolayer MOS2 system, but it is sensitive to thickness in the bulk MOS2 system. So the exciton dissociation takes place in monolayer MOS2 system, whereas there is the spin flipping in the case of bulk MOS2 system, and eventually it forms the triplet excitons. So to conclude, uh, um, so, um, so the type two band alignment is a prerequisite for the charge transfer and charge separation. Uh, this flatter band, that means uh, less steeper band, it promotes the coherent transport and hence exciton dissociation. And sometimes the, t uh, in t the spin lifetime also comes into play to determine the fate of city excitons. So basically these are the references. So more detailed information can be found here. So I would like to thank uh, our from my uh, previous group, the Chen Research Group at KU, uh, my advisor, Violin Chen, and lab members, Bobal and T. Our collaborators, Hugh Zhao at University of Kansas, and this talk would not uh, have been possible without the support of the current advisor, uh, Henry Captain and, and Margaret Murnen at the Captain Murnen Group at Zilla at CU. And thank you uh, for your time. So if you have any questions and if you want me to elaborate uh, something else, so I'm ready for that. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very nice talk, uh, Dr. Tika Kafle. So the talk is now uh, open for questions. Uh, if anyone has uh, 
uh, any questions, uh, please uh, unmute yourself um, and uh, ask. So while uh, people are thinking of questions, I you know just wanted to mention uh, that uh, um, uh, when the timer went off, um, you know my computer was on mute. Uh, you know, so people didn't hear. Um, so I'll try to unmute myself uh, in the following contributed talks. Um. 